From Bowling Green State University and the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society, this is BG Ideas. I'm going to show you this with a wonderful experiment. You're listening to the Big Ideas Podcast, a collaboration between the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society and the School of Media and Communication at Bowling Green State University. I'm Jolie Sheffer, Professor of English and American Culture Studies and the Director of ICS. As always, the opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of BGSU or its employees. Bowling Green State University and its campuses are situated in the Great Black Swamp in the Lower Great Lakes region. This land is the homeland of the Wyandot, Kickapoo, Miami, Potawatomi, Ottawa, and multiple other indigenous tribal nations present and past who were forcibly removed to and from the area. We recognize these historical and contemporary ties in our efforts towards decolonizing history, and we thank the indigenous individuals and communities who've been living and working on this land from time immemorial. Today I'm talking with law professor, journalist, and author Kevin Noble Millard, and illustrator and author Juana Martinez Neal. Kevin and Juana collaborated on the children's book Fry Bread, a Native American family story. They visited Bowling Green in March 2023 as part of the In the Round speaker series at BGSU and participated in an event at the Bowling Green Public Library where Maria Simone is Youth Services Coordinator for the Wood County District Public Library. Thank you all for joining me today. It's great Thanks to be here. Thank you. I, this is one for each of you in turn. Tell us a little bit about how you came to be interested in and involved in creating or teaching about children's literature. What are some of the key elements of your background that led you to this project in particular? Kevin, will you start us off? <laughs> I was going to kick it to Maria. <laughs> <laughs> well, I became a parent. And when our son was born, I was looking for books and I couldn't find any books that had good representations of Native and Indigenous people in it. And so I did a very naive thing and wrote my own, which now I, I feel when I look back at it is a little ridiculous, but I'm glad that it all worked out. And what about for you, Juana? Well, I had illustrated books before, and I had my first author illustrator book already released. But the manuscript of, of Freibert came to my desk and was sent to me, and, and I absolutely loved it. I loved it because I thought there were many connections with how I was raised and, and the fact that I'm from Latin America and how the, you know, the indigenous people uh, were, you know, misplaced and... and removed I don't know yeah. and I could connect a lot with you know what was said in the in the book in the manuscript and that's what I thought maybe maybe I could dare to uh, illustrate a book like that and I'm glad I did yeah Kevin can you take us back a little bit and talk us through what the process was like for you because you weren't a children's book author who presumably already had you know an editor you were working with a publisher so what was the process for getting this from your idea that there was a need for a book like this to actually the book in front of us? I had some board books by Jabari Asim. And I didn't know Jabari at all, but he was making these great books that I was reading to my kids. And so I sent him a message on Instagram. And I was like, hey, Jabari, I'm a law professor. I also write the you know, New York Times, like, can you help me out, man? And then he was like, sure. I mean, he was very gracious about doing this. And then he said, here's a list of editors that you should contact. And the first editor was Connie Shu at Macmillan, and she's the one I ended up working with. I didn't make it to the second editor. And it was nice. I know that's not most people's story, but... One thing, like having this New York Times thing, people listen a little more than they would to, they listen when you say New York Times. And so Connie listened to me and she did a very nice thing and she said, let's have a meeting in person. We did. And we were having a great conversation and I submitted a draft to her, which was terrible and bouncy and rhymy. And so in the nicest way, she said, oh, she's from Alabama. So she was like, bless your heart. 
<laughs> oh, sweet little journalist, <laughs> professor. Why don't you try it, you know, again? You know, it was just really, really sweet. And then I sent it back. And then she was like, oh, whoa, because I, I just changed it and really kind of dropped into it and wasn't trying to write a form. I just was what Juana tells me to do. I just didn't think I felt. Don't think, just feel. So I just felt and kind of cried and stuff when I was writing it. And it is what is closer to the version that we have now. And how did you get in touch with Juana? How did that partnership develop? Well, I was contacted by Connie. She thought I would be a good, I mean, she thought that I could be a good illustrator for the project. And, uh, but we did not know each other mm -hmm. until a little later when we started communicating and, and debating and discussing different things, different aspects of the book, um, details and, you know, things like that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, looking, she looked at my Instagram. Yeah. I made her a Tumblr page <laughs> with all my family pictures and pictures of people's clothes on it. So she mm. used a lot of those. I like research. So yeah. in, in order for me to create a book, I need the details. Details make it more unique, make it more, it goes from being a flat, you know, image to be a three dimensional full person, full you know, three-dimensional character that you're looking in the book. And that's what the details bring. So that's why I asked for the details. <laughs> yeah, and it was very, I would say the process was very dialectical. There was a lot of back and forth. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Juana hated me <laughs> in many moments. And one thing that we both wanted to do was to make sure that there was something special and kind of third dimension on yeah. every page. And it was really fun to like either think of those things to make the suggestion if I had one, most of them are hers, but if I was like, oh, what do we, what if we do like this on this page? That was fun for me because I'm not an illustrator, but it was like, oh, we can create this <laughs> together. And I remember when I got the sketches, I was in New York looking at them on this huge conference table in the Flatiron building, you uh -huh. know, the triangle looking building in Flatiron, New York. And we were right at the point <laughs> of the building on one of the upper floors. And I was like, yeah, this is bookmaking, <laughs> right? You know, it was at McMillan. It was in this creaky old building. I was having the best fun doing this. It was like a Tuesday. You know, I was like, this is what I do for a living now. It was so much fun. And we're just looking at all the different spreads and making notes about what we could do, what we could do to make things more representative, changing people's legs in some of the illustration, their hands, their body shape. There was a lot of discussion <laughs> back and forth. I think that one one aspect of this book that is different than other ones that I've illustrated is that this is not... I am not native from this country, and I am not Seminole. So it was very important for me to have those details right, because I am Peruvian. I am from South America, and I needed to be very careful <laughs> what I was illustrating and how I was illustrating the book. So I think that was that's the reason behind so much caution and, and, and attention to detail. Yeah. Yeah, there's one. I'll show you this. N n most people don't pick up on this one. I didn't even pick up on it until she told me, but that's the way this book is. I'll be like, what? I never noticed that before. You know, it's like five years later. But on the book cover yes. itself, when you take off the jacket, there is a picture on the back of this woman holding a cup of tea and she has a little biscuit right here, and the jacket has some white designs on a blue background, and those are Juana's hands. Yeah. Oh. And she doesn't even mention that those are yeah, her hands. Yeah, but it's the, wonderful. the whole idea of yeah. the She's literally in the book. Was that the whole family was there having the fry bread, sharing, but at the same time, this I, I wanted to be part of the illustration, and that's the only one there. I actually include myself. I wanted to be part of it, but 
I would not interrupt what was happening. I'm observing, I'm supporting, but I'm not interrupting. And this is actually what we call pan Frances, which is French bread in fruit, yeah. and chamomile tea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I do want us to get more into the book itself, but Maria, first, could you talk a little bit about how you got into your work, not only as a librarian, but specifically interested in children's literature? Sure, sure. Well, in college, I studied English, and I took two classes in children's literature for fun, and then went to law school, or d didn't go to law school, went to, to library science school, but was studying law and worked for years as a, a in a law library in, in a law firm in Chicago. And I realized I have much stronger sense of justice than this. And I w moved to Bowling Green and thought the public library is really where I belong. And children's you know, literature is really where I belong, and I was raising children, too, and so I worked there and am still working there. <laughs> so it's a, it's a really good fit for me, a really good fit. I love it. I love what the creative people in the industry are making, how they're working together, and being able to share that with kids and families. I tell people I am in a sweet spot <laughs> because I have the best materials, the best staff, and then we can put the, the this stuff together with people who come into the library and encourage people to come into the library and make it, you know, a comfortable, also very encouraging and supportive environment for for our for our community. So We're very, this is a yeah. very sweet book. Well, too, let's so. talk about the book. So for folks Delicious. who are listening, right, who may not have encountered the book yet, how would you describe the book, Kevin? What would be some of the kind of ways you would describe it to someone who isn't seeing it while we talk? We use food to describe the diversity of indigenous people in the United States. I think everyone cooks. Yeah. <laughs> people have great memories of cooking with people in their family. This is also a love letter to like old ladies <laughs> that, that, that make food for us, you know, and the way that you show love for people is invite them over to eat. You make food for them to eat and everyone can understand that. And it's also something that is a modern representation of native stories and food is modern, right? Food is not old. If it's old, you get sick. <laughs> <laughs> so the food is very current. And this is a way of, it could be introducing Native stories to people. And it makes it universal. But we also use the different ways that people make fry bread to say that this is also the different ways that Native people live and how they look. Because, I mean, even today, like, so I, I gave my recipe, I adapted this recipe from, like, old ladies in my family, you know, sharing the recipe in this book, and then I also put it on New York Times Cooking. And so you'll look in the comments, whether this is, like, you know, you see, yeah, you know, comments are everywhere on the right. internet now, right? Like, on blog pages or, like, article or the recipe section, and people are like, that's not fry bread. That's not fry bread. Because people are so picky about their fry bread, just like people are picky about whatever cultural family food they have, whether it's like baklava that their grandma made. Hummus is like really intense for some people. Kugel. Oh, boy. I mean, like yeah. all these like different foods and people are just like so jingoistic about it, right? And then so people – and they can get really mean in nice ways and not so nice ways and nice ways that are not nice. And people are like this for fry bread. Like this is fry bread. This is not. And people say the same thing about Native people. These are Native people. These are not. And then, you know, I am Afro-Indigenous, like my – dad is West Indian and my mom is Seminole from Oklahoma, you know, so they're like, we look different than what a lot of people think Hollywood Indians look like. We don't look like that. You know, I'm from Oklahoma. Like my grandparents spoke the language. We're all enrolled. The people still live there. My mother, my mother died last year. She's buried there, but we have a 
different, very real representation. And so our story is as real as somebody else's, as someone who grew up on a reservation in the Navajo Nation. We're the same, even though I live in Manhattan now. Uh, and just like the way that people make fry bread differently, it looks different, it tastes different, there are different ingredients. And I think food is a wonderful way to talk about how something is made or composed. And this is how we think of ourselves as people. We all have different little ingredients. Some of us might be cooked a little bit longer, you know, like me. <laughs> um, the ways that people make these are very different. <laughs> and so we use food because everyone understands it. Wana, could you talk about as you were developing the illustrations for it, you know, what were some of the things you were trying to make visible on the page to complement or add to what Kevin had created in terms of text? I wanted to have, I, it was very clear uh, when I was working on this book, I wanted the book to be seminal specific to honor Kevin and his family. At the same time, I wanted to in some way honor all native nations that are now in what is the U.S. And that was the idea behind the end papers, a way of finding yourself in that really long list of different nations. But when it came to the characters, I remember sketching the f very, very first spread, which is the one where it has the ingredients. And it reads, fry bread is food, flour, salt, water, cornmeal, baking powder, perhaps milk, maybe sugar, all mixed together in a big bowl. And I knew that for some reason, each one, each ingredient needed to be carried by someone else because that will make it, I don't know, it, it felt like a rollick in sound, an add-on one after another. And I found myself drawing all these characters. And as I was drawing them, I realized they all need to look different because that's what my family looked like when I was growing up in these family gatherings. We got together and we cooked and we spent the whole day together and we had a meal and then another one. <laughs> but we all look different. And, and that's what I wanted to do because we are not, I mean, we could be family, but we don't all look the same. Yeah. So that was something I think I was I, very, very clear. Yeah. Maria, what, I, yeah, what's I your experience I was going to say, I been? really appreciate the, 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 the diversity in the, the ages as well and the, the, there's the older women, the older man. There's a cat and a dog in this story. I mean, it's just so much family, so much activity. And that is where the kitchen, I mean, it's such a busy place that the uh, this this book just has so much movement in it and so much texture and so much vitality itself. And it just literally tastes good. You know? <laughs> so it's it's really rich to share with, with there's so many access points for this book and so many reasons to read it again and again and again and again and again. And this is what picture books ask us to do because that's what kids who take one look at it say, I need to see this again. There's more to study here. And what has been your experience with kids reading this book or books like the, it? We're, we move a lot when, when we read it because we're stirring. You know, we make our big bowl ourselves and we're stirring. And, and sometimes we are, you know, very much using our hands and... Yeah, this has just been really, really special to share with kids. We've had sort of a symphony of sizzling, you know, because the kids love to make sounds with their with their mouths, and that's a really important thing to do when you're learning to talk and learning to read is to, you know, discover your mouth and, and the different sounds it makes. So the sizzling and the, you know, um, it's really fun and, and just getting up and 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 dancing and and moving around so yeah we have not tasted fry bread but we have <laughs> talked a lot about different foods and talked a lot about donuts because we consider donuts to be fry bread i got to talk a lot about and we made we have little plates where we've made in our craft area like our own sort of family foods and so mine and i got to share with the kids it had lots of popping in it because it was popcorn i was raised by a single mom who didn't have a lot of time and we didn't have a lot of money, but popcorn was actually a really good dinner. And so popcorn was a way for us all to come together and put it in a big bowl. And that's what I told the kids. We had a big bowl, you know, 
and we would you, you know share because that's the this sharing is the part. sharing yeah. and and that that's what the library is all about that's what these picture books are all about and this book is just so special with that because not only is the is Kevin's language so lyrical and so beautiful and poetic and it reads like a song and then you're dancing so it's just so so full of energy and that's what we get from food right and from what, what we get from each other so it's very special and then there's just a lot of really important information in this book so this book just really went does go full on with with what picture books can do it when when we say picture books work this one works so beautifully so we're really 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 fortunate to be able to share this book with our community and to have the kind of generosity that we have with our community to to be able to literally share this book with well and on the subject of Children's books, although books generally quite often, but children's books also do have a kind of educational purpose, right? And so how were you thinking about that, Kevin, in in addition to kind of the story you wanted to communicate, how were you also thinking about kind of, you've got footnotes, you've got some additional things there for those who are interested in more. Could you talk through how you were thinking about that? This was intended to be a board book. Oh. I wanted it to be a board book, and I'm still sad that it's not a board book, you know, because there's just, you know, they're big, right? I wanted it to be a big board book with, like, very hard pages, because that's what I was reading with my kid at the time. Interesting. So that was my definition of what a children's book was, like, not this, which is, like, literature now. <laughs> so when they were like, I think you should write an author's note at the back, and I was like, okay, I'll do that. And so the original author's note started off as maybe like three paragraphs. And then the editors were like, why don't you add a little bit more? We did this. And so there were probably 41 versions this is great. of the end note. Because it would always turn around. I'd get another one. Megan was the assistant editor. And she'd be like, I think you need to write a little bit more. I got so many of these emails. And they were also using my skills because they were like, we know you can do research. We know that you can write in an academic tone. And you can write in an accessible like journalism people one. So I can do footnotes and you know, and taglines or what they would call a nut graph. And so it was just a lot of that. And then it was fun for me to do this because it was a new way of writing also because I could be a little even more free because it wasn't like there are constraints when you write for the New York Times, right? A lot of constraints that people don't really realize. So this was like, oh, I can be a little more free with my language. I can exaggerate stuff more because it's all about me and all about my family and then all about how this is representing us and food and how other people can connect to that. And so then it did become something that's a resource for parents, for teachers, for Librarian. people yeah, <laughs> who have never encountered right. Native stuff at all. And then when Juana comes up with this idea of let's put every tribe name right, in the in the end papers, at first I was like, oh, or this woman. <laughs> but she's going to hang Yeah, I was like, there are them. so many. I know, I know, I know. It's like you, you just look at just the art mm. of that itself and then. Yeah. Well, so I want to talk through why, what did that, where did that idea come from? And what, what did you think it would communicate <laughs> to name and list every tribe? Well, this all came from, if you have been to the American Indian Museum in, in Washington, D.C., they have that round wall, yes. the circular wall that goes Beautiful. up. And then you can find, if you were a donor, then you can, I mean, you could, do, there was a time where they were funding and then you could donate and then you they will have your name on the wall. If it was, I think, $100 or more, then your name will be there. And I remember I did it for my dad and my, da and my grandfather. So I... So it was the first time I went with my children and my husband there, and I remember looking for them. And I remember that act of following uh -huh. with my finger, uh -huh. and, oh, there he it is. is. Oh. And that was very significant. And that was the idea behind those end papers, that act of 
going through your finger and then reading and then until boom you find yourself and and i think that gives you a sense of identity and and you are recognized in some way by reading the name it's a little simple seemingly very simple act but i think it's very significant so that was the idea behind the the, the end papers and i knew we had 572 <laughs> hope I'm not wrong, but I thought they were 572 um, that were federal. Federal. Mm -hmm. You're right. And that was the initial idea. So I grabbed my list uh -huh. and, and then I right. started writing Just to be clear, 572 federally recognized yes. tribal nations. Federally right. recognized. And then, and th this is when I was like, ooh, this is going to be much harder <laughs> than we think it is. Because then I said, well, if we're being inclusive... We need to go to the state recognized tribes, and then some of the some tribes are going through a recognition process, but then they can't get over the hoop because, like, whatever powers that be, whether it's the federal government or that state government, might say your tribe isn't native enough, or you don't have enough proof, or there's not enough documentation. So I was like, how are we going to decide? what's in there and what not. So then I, you know, I'm a, also a fully tenured professor. So I was like, I think I'm going to get some research students uh -huh. <laughs> assistantships on this. So I had four students helping me out with nice. this. Because I was like, this is an academic project. Yes, it, it is. is. And this is in the service of coming up with the list because there had never been a full list of oh, no. all these tribes. So if you tried to do like every like Native American tribe, whether they are recognized or not, that's kind of impossible. Because there are some people that are like, we're a group of five people and we have a drum and we live in Berkeley, California and we are gluten free, right? We are indigenous. It's like, no, you're not. You're not at all. <laughs> you're just very organic. <laughs> That's not a tribe, but then they will be listed on Wikipedia as a tribe because anyone can do that. So you can't really figure out what all of these groups are, but if they've had some type of government engagement, any type at all, whether it's been successful or not, we put them in here. And I actually just had someone about a month ago that emailed me out of the blue and said, I love your book. But, but, oh, and I get these emails uh -huh. probably uh, like once every three or four months, but my tribe's name is not represented in the end papers. And I'll look through it and I'll be like, <gasps> and I'm always like, I get a little, you know, like, oh my God, what if it's not in there? Every time it's been in there. Nice. Every time. Because then people love to point their fingers, and you know, there'll the be picture. these little chubby kids <laughs> fingers, you know, point a little baby hand. And I love that, uh -huh. right? Because like Juana was, was saying, special. it's like people can see their name in there and they get so psyched. Mm -hmm. And then I was thinking, oh no, what if we miss this lady's tribe? And it was just like the way that the alphabetization <laughs> goes, it's a two page alphabetization. So I did find it nice. and I was like, you're seen. Wow, wow. <laughs> and for somebody who who is who is not in there, it's so impressive to see the 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 wealth of what is there. Yeah. And so yeah. there are names on here. Oh. I mean, they're still. I'm looking at it now. I'm like, oh, I forgot about that tribe. Yeah. Because there are just hundreds and hundreds of these names, places where you're never going to go, people that you're never going to meet. But then sometimes it'll be like you know. We are this small tribe in Alaska. Nobody has ever written about us. I've never, you know, it's not in a movie. It's not in a poem. It's not in a book. And thank you for putting our tribe name I, in here. Here's a picture of my little two-year-old uh -huh. hand uh -huh. pointing toward it. And it's like, yes, uh -huh. good for you. That's wonderful. Initially, I thought they were 572. Yeah. So I, that's the initial list that I hand wrote which is different than what is showing mm. here. The early proofs, right, the ones that the early copies that were sent to reviewers have that handwritten page. Oh, wow. But then eventually we switched them because he got to the point that <laughs> we said, well, Juana, we have more names <laughs> and there's some changes and the names are listed differently. And 
at that point, I figured, <clears throat> you know, I this is bigger than me, and and w once I'm not here, <laughs> they can continue editing and mm -hmm. adding names or changing things. As but, a librarian, yeah. thank you for the effort. Yeah, because <laughs> this is, I mean, for children, right? I mean, the effort that's made to to get the story just right, you know, it's kind of like the effort that you make to get your fry bread just right, yeah. <laughs> you know, and then it's compared to somebody else's fry bread. I, I was in a family years ago that did Chex Mix and they would give each other ch their their version, version of Chex Mix. Oh, you know, yeah. well, here's as if like, well, now, now you'll like it since I gave it to you because this one has peanuts and this one. Yeah, it's really, you know, it's, it's every, every, every family has you know, their story. So it's funny that you mentioned recipe development. So after I've written for the New York times for like 12 years now, but then after writing this fry bread book, now I write in food. Uh -huh. Cause I was like, why don't I write about food and the food desk? So then they were like, why don't you write about more like indigenous stuff? And so I've started doing recipe development, something I'd never done before. I mean, mm -hmm. I like to cook, uh -huh. but like I did not start off as a food writer, but writing recipes, it's also another skill, but you have to go and buy all these ingredients, do like little, you know, tweaks Science. here and there because all these other people are going to uh -huh. be using your recipe. So it was like another way of encountering editing because I did a recipe for grape dumplings. My mother was like, I was like, mommy, because that's what I called her. I was like, mommy, can you help me with this recipe for grape dumplings? And she's like, yes. And then she died a week later, which was really sad. But uh -huh. I was like, ah, uh -huh. I didn't get the recipe. The right. timing is wrong, right. mommy. Right. right. And which was really tough. So then I had to develop the recipe on my own. And, but a lot of it was guessing. Because she was like, yeah, we're going to do this. You have to do it in this very certain way. But I had to try this 15 times before I finally got it right. You know, there were a lot of throwing away food, a lot of testing and eating. But that's what you do in a book but as right, well. But there's right. also that moment where you are thinking of your mom yeah. during all oh, this process. Oh, yeah. Which is perfect for, right. you know, especially if you lose someone yeah. that you love so dearly it's like helps you with the grieving process i think yes I no it totally right. was yeah. and yeah. food is one of those things that is so tied to our memories yeah. right mm -hmm. smells and tastes that it's sort of like they're back they're they're with us again yeah oh, right it, it just it brings it you brings you right back to like oh i was nine year old yeah. nine years mm -hmm. old making fruit pizza with right her yeah. in right. the kitchen and then around the same time i came up with an idea to write a book about her and dying in a way that kids can understand, because I didn't feel that there were are enough books that deal with death. And right. there's food in there. There's more of this stuff. Because that's how we think about our family, and especially people that are not here anymore. Because Juana included wonderfully in the book, she included a picture of my grandma, aunt. I never actually had a grandma, but so her sister was still alive. So I call her my grandma. But she includes a picture of her in here. And one thing, it's like this happened. Uh -huh. I did not recognize oh, this that's wonderful. until I was giving a talk. Okay, if we're on a podcast so people can't see. So there's a picture in the end. We're in grandma's kitchen. And there's the little sister who's hoisting the baby up to get fry bread and grandma's picture on the other side. And I was giving a talk like three years afterwards. And I was like, oh, I didn't realize it, but it there was like, oh, why are you making me do this? <laughs> like, um, the bread is connecting the generations. <laughs> okay. Your turn to talk. <laughs> With, ah, I, I, I was would, hoping there I wouldn't would, be any tears in this <laughs> podcast. Right. This is such a touching book. <laughs> I, I want to share from the public library that if you have a library card, you can access this book online yeah. through our Hoopla digital resource. So it's wcdpl.org and the media drop down, the e media. And you can, right now, you know, on another screen, probably just <laughs> grab your Hoopla. And if you're clever enough, as a, an app on your, on your device or your phone. And you can listen to Kevin himself read this book to you. And, <laughs> and he, all of the, it's just very rich because all of the back matter is, is also read by Kevin or the author's note. 
is also red, and and the illustrations have a, a sort of a gentle animation. But there's also just the, also the book too is is available. So yeah, please think about the library as a resource. We're also really fortunate with the public television station to be able to give us copies of this book to share with school students as well as the public. So this this very generous book has inspired lots more generosity. So it's it's wonderful, and this is a this is a hardback book, so it's a really mm-hmm. generous offer from the public yeah. television station. They got a, a grant from Ohio Learns 360. But yeah, so the kids can put their own name in their in their book plate at the at the beginning of the book, covering up a couple of the, you know, uh, tribes. But the students, when they received this book, really enjoyed seeing that their name was going to be in the book. And then they can come to the library and have the author and the illustrator Side. autograph. And, and to yeah. meet an author and illustrator in person is very special. You hear you hear about this the this, collaboration, the collaboration, yeah. the problem solving, the inspiration. Um, just just um, sort of more is better, right? And but then getting it right for the kids. With that, we're going to take a quick break. Thanks for listening to the Big Ideas podcast. If you are passionate about big ideas, consider sponsoring this program. To have your name or organization mentioned here, please contact us at ics at bgsu.edu. Welcome back to the Big Ideas Podcast. Today I'm speaking with Kevin Noble Millard and Juana Martinez Neal, who collaborated on the children's book Fry Bread, a Native American family story. We're also joined by Maria Simone, Youth Services Coordinator for the Wood County District Public Library. So one of the things that we care a lot about in ICS is collaboration and especially sort of connecting the university with our wider communities. So, Maria, you were beginning to talk before the break about that. Could you say more about the partnerships that exist between the Wood County District Public Library and the university and maybe some of the other places where children's literature is being celebrated and promoted? Absolutely. Well, we sit, as I said, in a very sweet spot with these these wonderful materials that do bring in a lot of different people to to investigate and to to want to share them themselves. So whether they're educating at the university, whether they're students who are studying, we have a lot of interns that work with us to keep things very well organized at the library. And so we do a lot of partnering with BGSU as well as WBGU. PBS TV. Matter of fact, when I was leaving here, I ran into Kelly Feniger's partner colleague who was returning some books. So I said, I have to go. I have. You know. <laughs> but the library is often a place where we can find the partners because people are coming together. So I sometimes don't even have to go out for meetings because I run into, you know, our partners. But we have all kinds of tutors that work at the library for our tutoring program in the afternoons. And we've worked really closely with Heidi and with Jen for In the Round last year to bring in water protectors, author and illustrator. So that was extremely special. And yeah, this is just, we had so much fun. And this is a really, really special project in the round. I've really, really enjoyed myself going to the to the talks and the lectures and the performances and all that it is. And I I don't create myself. I have tried to write a, a children's picture book. Haven't had the success, but <laughs> you know, you know, when you say the book is not there, you know, I want I, maybe I assign myself to it. You know, I have had that kind of experience, and it's fascinating to to try to to you know to create that. But what I've had so much fun is is connecting books with kids. So this is a this is a really special book to be able to do that with. Kevin, I want to touch a little bit on some of your background. You've, you've alluded to this, but you're a law professor as well as, you know, a journalist with The New York Times, and you're a member of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma. Could you talk a little bit about how some of those experience may, if they, did they shape this book or was this sort of a really new skill set for you to develop? Like, what is that relationship between the other parts of your life, your other kind of professional roles and this work? So my mom grew up in the Seminole Nation in Oklahoma. Most of her family still lives there. And my dad's from Philly. 
I was raised and went to high school in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and it, this was the late 80s. So at this time, the high, the high school was not diverse at all. So I've always, I would say, felt like an expat where, you know, in my own home, right? Where I'm from Oklahoma, you know, the school felt weird. You know, I would also feel like not completely at home if I went to Seminole Nation because I'm from Tulsa. Now I live in Manhattan. You know, so it's always kind of like existing between different worlds and communities. And this is something that has been translated into my graduate work. I always write about like mixed race families, uh, diverse families. I write a lot about dads, right? You know, my favorite thing would be to write about a mixed race dad, like in an untraditional, family, something like just me search, um, what I could call that. And I've always done this topic, whether it's in academic work, journalism work, for the times I did entertainment, film and TV for a while. And all of the, the topics I did were like native films, representation of identity and native films. I mean, this is the stuff that I do my work in. I've got my, this is what I wrote my dissertation in. Bread and butter. To totally. <laughs> yeah. So it's the same topic, but different audiences before I've said it where it's like speaking the same language, but with a different accent. Mm -hmm. So it could be for grownups. It could be for really nerdy grownups. You know, these are the other professors on your tenure committee. It could be for just general grownups or really short people, which would be a kid's book. Mm -hmm. And what up for you? You've talked a little bit about your background and being from Peru. How do you think about kind of the work on this book as part of your larger body of work? In what ways was this a continuation? In what ways was some of this maybe different? I think every every book is different, and every book is an extension or as a stretching of your work. Otherwise, why would you work on the same book over and over again? It's just to me, it wouldn't ha serve a purpose. So it, it, each book is a little different. This is the first book I illustrated that had a native theme and where I represented native people from here from the U.S. I thought it was a beautiful subject matter that I was really for a long time interested in and and it happened. I mean, I, I really hoped to do something like this, but, you know, sometimes it takes time to get to do it. And how do you see this book fitting in relative to the other books? Because you're an illustrator as well as an author illustrator, mm -hmm. right? Are there common themes? Yes, the, I think the common theme is identity, uh, the understanding of self, who you are, what what are who you are in the world, what's your place in the world, and that's something that runs throughout all my work. Yeah, it's consistent. Yeah. Her her body of work is beautiful. She's creating new books all the time. We cannot wait to see what's next. But it's fun to put the, to to have shared this and then to to ask kids. Do you see some other similarities with these books that, and, and the kids are very much drawn to just the way Juana does children's bodies is very, very special. The, the bellies and, <laughs> and, and just the eyes are just exquisite. So totally look carefully, yeah. look carefully. And you can tell that she's looking carefully and looking, you know, with her heart as well. And so there's just so much love in her, in her books and the animals. We really like the animals and the <laughs> sense of humor. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, there's just, there's just, and a lot of action. Yeah. So please check out all of Juana's books because we have them at the library, <laughs> although they're moving off the shelves very fast. Well, that is on one a, of the, oh, please oh, go I ahead. I was Kevin. on a Zoom with Juana earlier this week. And in the background is her dog, oh, <laughs> like in the in sunning right, himself right, in the right, window, right? And the cat, the cat is <laughs> yeah. like in baby moon, you know? Or, or, yeah, baby moon. That was my cat uh, oh, and my oh, dog. And so <laughs> yeah, cat, the, you're right. The Little cat, pieces of you. When when yeah. the cat is giving itself a bath, you know, the, just all these touches that are just. And this is the, a children's book, right? When they when you look at it carefully which children do because they have that kind of focus 
Well, and that's one of the things about children's books, right? Is that like, it's not the kind of book you read once. Children want to read them again and again and <laughs> again and again and again, <laughs> right? Agreed. And so, you know, I imagine that's part of what you're thinking about, Kevin, in terms of the words. What are words that, you know, have a kind of lyricism that invites rereading and, and new layers and want to, it sounds like you're building in things that they can discover new things each time they encounter it. I always keep in mind that sometimes the children that will look at the books don't have the words yet. Mm -hmm. So the way they're reading the story is through the images. So with that in mind, you have to give them all this little information so they can actually keep themselves, you know, busy looking at all the details. Yeah. It's I think research. In a, in a, yeah. I think <laughs> and in a really like deep, well thought picture book, there are a million stories going yes. on all on the same page, yes. right? And it's not just representative of what the words are saying, but also, you know, how the characters are interacting with each mm -hmm. other. You know, we can understand body language. Mm -hmm. We can put that on a page. What is the interaction between the pictures and the words, right? It's almost like a music video, like from the 80s on MTV, <laughs> right? You know, like sometimes it'd be like very literal yeah, and that. other times it's like, what is the connection of this Duran Duran <laughs> video and this spaceship, right? Like, So, uh, you know, there's that, right? But then there's that interplay, which tells, uh, you know, an even a third story. <laughs> and just like wanting to turn the page. This This book really encourages you to turn the page to see what's next where, where where is this you know where is this song going and then what's going to happen next and how am I going to get involved in it as a final question sort of an open-ended one but you know many of our listeners are students or recent grads and sort of trying to find their own way in the world and kind of figuring out how do I follow my passion how do I find a professional path that is really meaningful satisfying so each of you, like, what advice do you have for maybe a young person who's at that cusp and maybe afraid to sort of take the leap into something more creative or off the kind of safe path? What advice would you give, Juana? The first thing I would say is pay attention to what you love, because that you will find a thread throughout, you know, those little things that you love, being music or pottery or cooking, patterns, you know, little things. And pay attention to what you love and life will find a way I think <laughs> to throw you into that situation where you just have to make it happen but it will happen on its own time you can't push anything you can just pay attention and be present and you know I, I wish I'm, I was more you know yeah what about for you Kevin polite annoyance gets things done <laughs> I, I really, really think that because a lot of times I, it's it's hard, right? When you think like, oh, well, maybe my work isn't that great or maybe someone else is really good at doing this, but that other person is also, they have the confidence of doing that. And then so a lot of times I can talk myself out of things, but I realize, I mean, even just sitting here right now, I think, some of the things that I've gotten are because I was being annoying, right? But in a very nice, polite way, like you, you want the people to like you. Driven, yeah, yeah. Driven. Being, being persistent. Determined. I think that's how I fell in at the times. Yeah. And that's been the only place that I've ever published. I'm kind of scared to publish with other places. Because I'm like, what if they don't like my writing? Right? <laughs> like, I think they probably would, right? With children's books also, it was about, okay, let me ask this person who I don't know how you get that done. And they had a good response for me, calling the editor. Hey, do you want to have lunch? Until she says yes. And these were all, like, not traditional ways of doing it. But that's how polite annoyance gets things done. I um I, I that's these are wonderful answers and these are exactly why I like going to things like in the round or the Mazza Museum and hearing at the University of Finlay hearing other authors and illustrators talk just the creative people they really they have great ideas but then they do know how to get it done I I often tell college students that are at the library that are 
graduating and maybe they've done an internship at the library, then they're not sure whether they want to work at a library or where they want. But I say, I would have never thought when I was leaving college that this is where I'd be. I just didn't know myself well enough. I kind of knew what I liked, but I didn't really know myself well enough. And so I think saying yes to opportunities is always really, really important. And, and just to sort of let yourself, you know, let things happen that you, you sort of see that was a good thing, you know, or maybe that wasn't a good thing, but it certainly did inform me as to like what I do want to do. So I say yes. Thank you all so much for talking today. It's been a real pleasure. Listeners can keep up with ICS Happenings by following us on Twitter and Instagram at ICSBGSU and on our Facebook page. If you're interested in the round, make sure to keep an eye on the BGSU website for those events. You can listen to Big Ideas wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Please subscribe and rate us on your preferred platform. For more information or to propose a guest for a future episode, visit us at bgsu.edu forward slash BG Ideas. Sound engineering for this episode was provided by Caitlin Herman, Marco Mendoza, and Brendan Akachora. Research for this episode was by Joe Elliott.